God's plan uh, for sex and sexuality. Um, I'm not going to be weird. I don't want to be weird about it, and I also don't want you to be. I realize we're at different levels in maturity, but I'm going to call all of us to, to like, grow, to be grown up about this. I don't want this to be a weird subject for us. Sometimes, like, in church buildings, it's like, this is not usually where we talk about this kind of thing. And, uh, but I want us to be grown ups about it. So can we do that? Go like this, if you can be grown up about this subject. I want us to think differently. I also don't want to talk down to you. So I want you to know that this message I gave to a bunch of 75 year olds that Sunday. I gave this message to people my age. I gave this, I, I, I spoke to everybody um, on this subject. And so I don't think, this is not a message like uniquely for you. Like this is a message about sex to teenagers. I'm going to take 30 minutes to tell them about how bad it is and they should never do it. And it's not like that. This is, a, this is like, I want you to think bigger than maybe what you have thought before about this subject or that you've been allowed to think before about this subject because this is a big deal. And I think we ought to talk about it. I think the church ought to talk about it. The Christian schools should talk about it because everybody else is. Uh, our, our culture is hypersexualized, and people are talking about this everywhere. You can't, like, turn on the TV or drive down the street street or the interstate without billboards talk, you know, bringing up sexuality, um, magazines, everything, you know, social media, it's everywhere. And so if the church isn't talking about it, when I use the church, I mean just like the people who attend in the church, like the church, the Christian church, of which we are part to Jesus. If we're not talking about it, it's like we're the only ones that aren't, and probably the, the ones that should be talking about this. So I want to deal with that today, and, I, and you can just be praying for me that I would do that in a way that's helpful and biblical, and, and that would be really good for us today. Um, I also want you to talk about it because uh, not only do we live in a hypersexualized culture, but um, everybody in this room has an issue um, in this area. Like everybody. So I wanted to be weird, but can you just kind of look around at the people around you? Fellow students, even the teachers. Everybody, everybody in this room has an issue with sexuality. This is, this is something that affects everybody. Maybe, maybe for you the issue is, it could be, I don't know, it could be that you are in an inappropriate sexual relationship with somebody right now. Like you've been in that for maybe a long time and maybe nobody knows about it. Just, just you two. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Um, maybe that's that you base your self-esteem on how you feel about like how you look, like your body, like am I sexually attractive? And like uh, for guys and girls, and, like you measure yourself like as a person that way. And you think of yourself in terms of your sexuality based on appearances, as if like that's where it's at. Maybe that's your issue. I don't know what your issue is. Um, maybe it's uh, escaping into romantic fantasy in your mind and going to places that are just not good. That aren't real, and uh, or maybe it's addictive patterns in your life. Maybe it's some of the issues that you have are related to sexual addictive stuff like pornography. I don't know what your issue is. Everybody's got an issue. Right? Maybe it's the way we view people and how the first thing we think about is how they look and how they appear. And are, you know, it's just we're messed up. We are messed up. And God speaks to us about this, so we want to look to His Word today because that's where we get our views of sex and sexuality. So I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 1 is where I'm going to go back to uh, the beginning and look at scripture. Uh, if you guys want, I don't, know, I don't know if you have phones or stuff in your life. So. If not, have um, a Bible in front of you. I'd love for you to see it. It's Genesis 1, and I'm going to read, as it says on the screen, verse 27 and 28, and then uh, chapter 2, 18 to 25. And you can sort of follow along if you could. And maybe kind of like we do in church. Would you please stand and read God's word? Go ahead, stand. Go ahead. Chapter 1. I'll read verse 27 and then into verse 28. And then I'll jump to chapter 2, verse 18. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. In some translations, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. All right, skip over to chapter 2, verse 18 and following. It says, the Lord God said, 
It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. This is such a weird part of the Bible. Like, I'm just, can you imagine this? Okay, giraffe, hippo, we're going to call you this, we're going to call you that. So he's calling, he's giving them names. Like, I don't know. So, so the man names all the livestock, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. But for Adam, like, so he's, he's looking around, he's like, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Like, everybody's got a date, but, but Adam. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and he closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman. He made a woman out of a rib. And he'd taken out a man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she is taken out of a man. And it says, God says in his word, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us understand this subject that we're talking about today from teach us Holy Spirit and uh, have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's it. So I have to ask a true or a three, kind of just a few questions in a true or false survey. Um, and uh, here's, here's a true or false survey of you guys today. True or false, um, and you don't have to call it out because I'll ask for a show of hands. True or false, God is against sex and sexuality. True or false, God is against sex and sexuality. How many think that's true? Raise your hand. God gets it. Okay, how many think it's false? The rest of you. True or false, the church is against sex and sexuality. How many think that's true? Couple. How many think it's false? False. True or false, Hillcrest Lutheran Academy is against sex and sexuality. How many think that's true? Seriously? Okay, and how many think that's false? Okay. Um, true or false, the staff at Hillcrest Lutheran Academy, the teachers, the principal, the board, and all of them are against sex and sexuality. True or false? How many think that's true? How many think that's false? Yes. Okay. So, isn't it interesting? Um, we have uh, often this misunderstanding about what the church, Christian people, Christian leaders, and even God himself is for and what he's against, right? We have these, I think these misunderstandings. A lot of people think that God is against it. How could he be? Like he made it. Like it was his idea. Like he gave sexuality as a gift to man and woman and said, enjoy. This is for you. I made this for you. This is my idea. This is, you're going to love this idea. You're going to so love this idea. Uh, not just the act of sex, but you're going to love the, the nature of sexuality. You're going to love it. It's awesome. It's my gift to you. And so often we think, oh man, this is weird, and like everybody in the church is so against that. And that's often what people think. I wonder, I wonder why that is. I think we brought that on ourselves. Because so often, it seems to me that historically, all the only way that the church has spoken about the issue of sexuality is in a negative way. Like we're always against something. And we talk about it as if it's like the major culprit in the corruption of society. Sexuality is really bad for culture. God made it. It's his idea. It's really good. It's a beautiful thing. But the church is reacting. It's not proactive. It's a like counterpunching. It's always on defense. It's not on offense on this subject. It criticizes the world's view of it rather than offering something better. Here's the way I want to talk about it today. I think the world is telling you and me a story. It's got a narrative about this issue of sex and sexuality. And it's got this story it's telling, and we just like curse the story that the culture's telling. We just say the culture's got a bad story to tell. They're telling us something awful, and we curse the story they're telling us, rather than come up with a better one. Like, I think we have a better story to tell. Like, the story about sex and sexuality that we have from the Bible is a way better story. So we can either curse the culture, or we can tell a better story. 
we can say they got something better to offer than what the world is offering up. So that's what I want to do today. Because God thinks this is a good thing. We need to offer that. Sexuality is something God created is powerful and good. And it's for our blessing. It is a gift to us. In fact, just a just a almost like a sort of a quiz. Do you know what the first commandment is? The first commandment in the Bible. This might be a slightly trick question. So if you're brave, raise your hand. Okay. You know, what do you think? What's that? A lot of times people say, oh, confirmation. We learned like the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, shall know what God's before me. The first commandment in the Bible is verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1, which is, be fruitful and multiply. Like, God told two naked people in a garden, be fruitful and multiply. Modern day translation, have sex and make a lot of babies. That's basically the first commandment in the Bible. If the first thing, God doesn't tell them not to do this, not to do that. The first thing he tells people to do is to have sex and make babies. I got this plan. It's a really good one. This is what I want for you. And this is, this is the first commandment. So how can God be against it? Like I said, I think the story that the Bible tells about sex is so much sexier than the one told by the world. So we need to tell that story. Let's not make perverted and twisted and ugly and weird and awkward the story. Let's, let's think about it like grown-ups and as people who recognize God made us this way. And it's a beautiful thing as God tells us how this gift is to be unwrapped and how it is to be used and enjoyed in his provision for us. So what is this story that we get to tell? The story is this. The Bible says that sex is a two- but one flesh experience meant to be shared by a man and a woman in the context of marriage that reflects God's three but one reality. I'm going to say that again. That sex in a visible sense is God's gift to us. It is a two but one flesh experience meant to be shared by one man and one woman for life in the context of marriage that reflects God's three but one reality. When I say the word trinity, that's what, like, three but one is what we should think of. Like, he's three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, one God. How many gods? One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A lot of people go, I don't get that. I would say, I don't either. I take it by faith. I don't quite get how that could be. But God is three, revealed in three persons, but he's one God. And God says that a sexual relationship a relationship between a husband and wife is actually like, it's like, it's like, oh, like this. Oh, you can't see it because you're down there. Like, here's me, but over there is my shadow. Like, that's not me, but like in the, like the light makes a shadow. So God's like saying, here's the reality. God is three, but one. Like, down here in the shadow of that reality is your way of living and experiencing it. And this two, but one relationship. Two people, one flesh. He's three but one. In marriage, a man and woman are two but one. In mind, body, and, and in a soulish connection as well. It's easiest, perhaps, for us to think about it in a sexual way. Okay? Because in, in a sexual sense, um, a man and a woman, two people, become one. Right? I don't need to explain that any further. I have no... Slides for this. This is already like the PG-13's, you know, message. We're not going to make it any worse. But in a real sense, two become one. God says on a soulish level, it's meant to be that way for us as well. God wants it for us on a soulish level. Two are made one. A man and woman acting out, experiencing in their sexual relationship the oneness that Jesus talked about when he said this. And you can take a look at the screen. Matthew chapter 19, starting at verse 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. And notice what, what, what they're referred to here as this is a man and his wife. This is, this is a husband and a wife coming together. They're 
They're married. And some of you are going, okay, wait a minute. Like, um, where is the wedding? Like, I don't remember. Anybody ever read Genesis and go, this is a husband and wife, but I don't see a wedding anywhere? Like, where is the, where is the wedding? Because here's what we think of. We think of, well, we think of this. We think of up here. We think the preacher is right about here. The altar, he stands here. Bridesmaids, groomsmen, they come down and the thing and the tux or the suit and the dress and everybody and dad walks her down the aisle and you ever wonder how they get up here, by the way? We put steps out for our weddings. That's what we do. There's special steps right there. And they come up and, and this is where it happens and, they, and we have this, this is our American view of a wedding. And we're going, I don't read that in Genesis 1. So like, where is that? Where does, where does that happen here? I don't get it. This is such a, this is, cultures have formed weddings and they look at different. If you've traveled and some of you are MKs, maybe lived in other cultures, can talk about this, there are different, different settings. Students from different cultures are here. They can talk about their different, different settings. Cultures recognizing the dignity and sanctity of marriage create ceremonies. And with them, for example, in our culture comes this piece of paper, this marriage certificate that's saying you're, you're married, you're licensed, and, and it's, there it is. And, it's more than that because we live in a literate society. This, marriage, this piece of paper stands as a permanent, tangible witness to the union. But it's a marriage. And we have Adam and Eve who are married, God Himself presiding over it. And Jesus here in Matthew 19 is helping us understand that physical oneness is more than body parts and nerve endings. It's more than that. It's a soulish kind of connection that we all long for. We want, a, we want a connection with somebody on a soulish level. We want to know them. We want to be known by them. And God says in the physical sense, this, this physical relationship of two becoming one kind of reflects that idea. But society's story, culture's story about sexuality is so much different. Here, here's in short what the culture society is. Everybody listening? Everybody with me? Culture's society story, culture story is basically you are an animal, right? And you are an animal. Is what you are, and so sex and sexuality is just part of your instinct, and it's you know it's doing what your body craves because you can't help it. So it's not a moral thing. You're just a you're just an animal doing what animals do, right? Some of you may remember I gave a, a different talk or message on a Sunday morning. I talked about the London Zoo in 2005 and how they had a human like exhibit of you know Homo sapiens in an enclosure. I got a picture of it, but, you know. And there's a sign that's warning humans in their natural environment. They actually had people, like, in an enclosure. So the primates are here, and the humans are here. What's the message? You're just like them, right? Like, you are just an animal. It is who you are. They actually put people in a zoo. And the point is that you're an animal, doing what animals do. Sexuality is just biology. It's not morally governed. You're just doing what your instincts demand, and you can't help it. And that's the world's story. You're nothing but an animal, and, and morals are nothing, have nothing to do with it. So there's no moral constraints to it. There's no moral no thing that governs it. And we go, really? The Bible's got a better story. Sometimes you see that picture. It shows this is just who you are. You're just an animal in this line, doing what animals do. The Bible says that your body's desires and your soul's desires are linked. I want everybody to do this. Take your hands, do this with them, okay? And, and so your body's desires and your soul's desires are linked. But there, there's a sense in which your soul and your body are tethered together. There is an understanding in some uh, cultures and in history, sort of a dualistic point of view, where it says that your body and your soul are completely separate from one another, and you can think of them as totally separate. The Bible joins them together. It says your soul and your body are tethered one to another. That you're more than just a soul wrapped in a body. You're more than that. What you crave for, what you long for, is relationship. What you want is companionship. What you want is to be with somebody. Who wants to be with you? That's what you want. You want true love. You want someone who loves you for who you are, not for what you can do for them. Now, what favors you can do for them, but somebody who just loves your soul. Wouldn't that be great? Everybody look at me for a second. Wouldn't it be great if you found somebody who just loves your soul? Like, not how you look, 
I know what you do, how kind you are, but they just love your soul. Like, I love you. Like, how can you know I like you? That's what I really love. I think that's what we want. We want to be with somebody who wants to be with us. We want to share our life with someone, good times and bad times, to come home to somebody who's expecting us, somebody who wants us there. That's what we want. That's what our, our soulish desires are. We want someone to confide in. Listen to this. We want someone to tell our secrets to. We want somebody to know us and to know them. Now, I want to tell you something a little bit like odd. Have you guys ever heard this word used in the Bible when it talks about a sexual relationship and it uses the word no? It uses, it uses the word no. Like in, um, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says that Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You're like, okay, I know what's going on there, but that's a weird word to use. Adam knew his wife and she got pregnant. So what's, it's a sexual reference. It's talking about intimate knowledge, closeness, being known by someone. That is so amazing. So like this soulless desire that we have to be known is reflected in this word. Here's the word, yada. Like, you know, like, oh yeah, yada, 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 yada. Can you say that with me? Yada. Yada. Yada, yada. That's the word to know. It's actually to know in a deep way, in a soulish kind of connection. So here's what we want. Everybody like, we want someone to know us, to yada us. Not in a sexual way necessarily, but we want someone to know, to know us. When Adam knew his wife in a sexual way, it's like he knew her physically, but he knew her soul. Like it's this, you guys, it's like your soul and your and your body are tethered together. God has made you a whole person. You come together, and this is what we long for. We want someone that we can make happy, somebody who makes us happy, someone that we can trust, someone who, who loves us enough to tell us the truth, someone who won't leave us when life is hard. We want somebody like that. And here's what happens. Okay, I'm jump up here for a second. Sometimes what we do is we interpret the longings that we have in our soul for being known and to know someone, yada, in a sexual way. And, and we've, what we need is oh, so, so much deeper than that. Like, security and love and, and to be accepted and to be known, but there's someone who knows our secrets. That kind of connection with a person. But we don't know, especially when we're younger, we don't know how to interpret that, so we think what we really want is we find that person attractive. And we're like, we interpret it in a sexual way, and what happens is when we interpret a soulish need and, and, and carry it out in a, in a physical way, we get hurt. And we find out that we can never be satisfied in this relationship when it's just physical, because what we want is so much deeper. Does that make sense? Like sometimes we don't understand what we're feeling, we don't understand what we really want. And that's part of what it means to be human, is to get that wrong sometimes. Sometimes what we think and understand about ourselves is wrong, and we've been told a story along the way, by the way that goes along with this, that we're just biology, and that sex is just biology, and that we are just biology, and it's just about body parts and nerve endings, so there's no moral constraint, and it's a lousy story. And it's why we get frustrated, too. Um, somebody, I've heard somebody put it like this. It's an awkward. It's like, um, it's like this. It's like giving um, a kid a really powerful car, like a Porsche or a Lamborghini or a McLaren, and telling them, it's your car. You can have it. He's like, sweet. But you can't drive it. You have to keep that baby parked in the garage until you get married. And then you can take it out. It's like, it, it doesn't almost seem cruel that God has made you with desires, soulish and physical desires that are powerful and strong. And then the world is like giving you a car and you're like, here you go, it's your 16th birthday. Have this. And you're like, I can't drive it? Like, this is crazy. It's like, I, oh, 
every part of me wants to drive the car, and you don't. You can't drive the car. And it almost seems cruel, but what if you did? You're gonna hurt somebody. Like you're gonna hurt somebody. Um, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna ruin you, you're gonna ruin the lives of others if you don't recognize that this amazing, powerful gift comes with with boundaries and a, like there's a plan for how this is to be used. And it's like I've gotta trust the plan because I don't quite understand how this works right now. Someone, someone else has used the metaphor of fire, that sex is powerful. And sexuality is powerful, that it's like a fire. And that out, inside boundaries, it's really, have you heard this illustration? Right? Like inside boundaries, fire is really a good thing. You can cook hot dogs with it, and marshmallows are whatever. You can make food with fire that's in a boundary, like in an oven, in a fire pit, you know, whatever. Fire outside of boundaries will destroy a house, a neighborhood, a community. If you turn on the news to ever see like flames of like Southern California, it happens every year, and it gets out of control, and houses and neighborhoods burn down because fire got out of its boundaries. And, and sexuality, sex is like that where, where it's a powerful thing, but unless we understand what the boundaries are, it gets out of control, and we don't understand and it hurts people. Instinctively, we understand that there is a need and a connection between our soul and our body. And we think about this only once in a while when we're, we're helped to understand it. We often separate the two, but God brings them together. We have a soulish connection, we have a physical connection, and God links these things together and says, this is the way it is. So in a real sense, when a person engages in sexual intimacy, you're not just touching somebody's body, but you're coming about as close, listen to this, you're coming about as close as is humanly possible to touching somebody's soul. This is why God says, 1 Corinthians chapter six, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in the body? For it is said that two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. Like, run away. Like, run for your life. Run. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body, like you're sinning against you. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So we see in this text that your body, not just your soul, belongs to Christ. And that sex outside the boundaries of marriage that God has set up is a sin not just against God, but against yourself against your own body because you're offending the very purpose for which um, you were made. And also says that God says that your body is his temple. And he wants to use your wants you to use your body in a powerful way. And that there are soulish spiritual implications to how we use our bodies. And we recognize that. It has such power. So the Bible says that sex outside the, 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 the boundaries of marriage, which is a permanent and exclusive Commitment, they're hurting themselves and others. And so let me just give you a couple examples of what that looks like. Any substitute for marriage, any substitute for marriage, like cohabitation, living together before marriage, premarital sex, mocks God and rips people off. You included. Like you ripping them yourself and someone else off by choosing to live together before marriage. Every once in a while, somebody comes to me and says, Pastor David, I want to get married. And one of the conversations that we have is, so tell me about your relationship now, where you're at. And once in a while, uh, somebody will talk about, yeah, we're living together, and we talk about that, and find out what the reasons are for that. And sometimes it's somebody from outside the church, and they have no idea um, what we teach, and they just come to thinking, this is sort of normal now, isn't it? People will kind of try it out, take him or her for a test drive and see if this is going to work. And then if it seems to be working, we'll, we'll get married. 
Do you know that's one of the worst ways to begin a relationship? You've already said that having a ring on your finger does not determine your sexual behavior. Like, I don't need a ring to have sex with somebody. And so now I want to marry you and I'll put a ring on, but you know, before it didn't matter if I had a ring, so why wouldn't I be able to have sex with somebody else because it didn't matter before? It's like one of the worst ways to begin. Biblically, it's not just wrong. Socially, culturally, so, uh, socially, in terms of social science, one of the worst ways to begin a relationship is to live together before marriage. Did you know that? Like, like research, research shows that to have a long, enduring, lasting relationship, one of the worst things you can do is choose to live together before marriage. Wow. Like, not only does the Bible tell us that, but, like, social science bears that out. If you want more information on that, contact me. I will send it to you. It's fascinating to me. So, like, even if you don't accept God's plan for sexuality, social science shows it's a terrible way to begin. Just a terrible way to begin. But we also recognize from Scripture that it mocks God, and it rips people off. Also, any redefinition of marriage, like homosexual marriage, mocks God and rips people off. Any breaking of a marriage vow, like infidelity or divorce, mocks God and rips people off. Some of you come from homes where there has been divorce, and you're like, yes, I got ripped off. My mom and dad split. That is exactly the way it feels. I, I've been robbed. They're hurting too. We need to love them. But you know it because you've experienced it. So God has set these boundaries. He's told us the right way to go. He's and I'm grateful that he's done. He says, here's the boundaries. Here's the ways. It's like, here's the playing field. Go have fun. Go live. Like, go enjoy. But here's the boundaries. Like any game needs to have boundaries in order to, to enjoy it. You ever play a game with no rules? It's terrible. It's like absolutely no fun. You need the rules because you need to find out how, how does this work. Because there's a plan. God has a plan for your sexuality. Let me wrap up by saying this. I, I think it boils down to um, the, the longing that our, our bodies experience. It's not just this biological urge. The, the longings that you have uh, as teenagers, um, are in a physical sense, being with somebody in a physical sense, is not just your DNA wanting to propagate itself and make it into the next generation. Um, it's it's reflection. It's the shadow of the soulish longings of your heart to know, to yada, to be known by somebody. And here's the reality. It's a beautiful thing. God knows you. He knows everything about you. You are no mystery to him. He God is you. Not a weird sexual thing. He knows you. He knows. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He knows who you did it with. He knows what you watched. He knows what it happened. He knows every detail about your life. And he absolutely is crazy about you. He loves you. And he invites you to yaw at him. So here's what's so cool. That when we when Adam knew Eve, she conceived. And when we know God, not in a physical, sexual sense, but in a spiritual sense, when we in a solar sense, when we know God, something is born. A new life in us. A new life to be born again through knowing God in Jesus Christ. That's amazing. What you want more than anything in life is to be known and to be loved and to know someone else and to love them. And what you really want and for the rest of your life you will pursue that and you will never find it fully, 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 fully until you find it in God. The best thing short of that is marriage. God invites you to enter into a relationship where in the safety of a covenant, of a promise, you say to somebody, it's safe to just be who you are. And I won't do it perfectly like Jesus does for you, but it's like the closest human thing that we can experience. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Go after that. Pursue that. Like, forget the stupid lies that our culture is that you're just an animal. You can't help it. Don't do what you were made to do. <laughs> no, God, it's a better story. This is your beautiful. You're made for relationship. Don't take any cheap substitute and counterfeit. 
So where have you been? You know, God knows you. And I want to tell you that wherever you're at, that God can give you a new beginning. He can, uh, he can clean what you have dirtied in your soul. He can mend what you've broken. He can gather up what you have given away. He can restore those things for you. You can't undo, right? Anybody know that? I can't undo what you've done. But He can cleanse you. He can forgive you. He can give you a new beginning. I, I said in the beginning that every one of you has an issue with sex and sexuality. I don't know what your issue is, but Jesus, Jesus speaks to you and he just invites you to yada him, to know him. Because in that, you're angry and a beautiful thing happens. You begin to understand yourself, the ladies we talked about identity today. You begin to understand yourself in a whole new way. You understand who God is and you see yourself through the lens of, of, of Christ's eyes for you. It's good. Thanks, you guys. I think you've been listening today. At least you look like you have. And I appreciate your doing that today. I won't take that I like to pray. Thank you, Lord, for the better story that you tell in your word. Thank you that we get to believe that today. Thank you that you know us. I pray that um, you would forgive us for the destructive ways that we have interpreted the belongings of our soul to know people, to know others, to be known. In a physical way that robs, rips people off and mocks you. Forgive us for that, Lord. Thank you for the beginnings of cleansing and grace. We need that and we need that. Help us not just to curse the culture story, but to tell a better one. And, I, and that's my prayer too, that we believe it, but we would just go from this place like saying, the, the world is lame. They have such a lame story about sexuality. It's such a base, sort of animalistic, sort of unsophisticated view of it. We have, we have something better. Help us to believe a better story and to live in this world.